Hello. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Sandeep Juneja, a senior professor and a former dean of the School of Technology and Computer Science at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in India. Currently, uh, Sandeep is also a visiting researcher at Google Research in Bangalore, India. Sandeep received his PhD in operations research from Stanford University. His academic genealogy tree is quite interesting. It has two roots, namely Laplace and Lagrange, and it includes many famous mathematicians, including Fourier and, and Hilbert. His areas of interest include mathematics of agent-based simulation models, sequential learning, financial mathematics, and game theoretic analysis of use. Sandeep has served as an associate editor for many prestigious journals, including ACM Transactions on Modeling and Computer Simulation, Mathematics of Operations Research, and Management Science. He's currently on the editorial board for Stochastic Systems. Today, he'll talk about an interesting approach to develop agent-based simulators for COVID modeling. Sandeep, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ravi, for the introduction. I think all of us would have the genealogy, right, if you go back uh, far enough. But very happy to be giving this talk to your group and hoping to learn from it. So, you know, I'm hoping this will be interactive and I'll get a better sense of different things that your group is doing related to agent-based modeling. As we were discussing, you know, this was, I think, in, uh, I guess, March of 2020, when COVID started hitting us and all of us were enormously worried and were wondering what we can do. And then we saw this forecast from Neil Ferguson's group about millions of people dying in the US, UK, and so on. And when we looked deeper, we found that he was actually doing Monte Carlo simulation. So that seemed like something we could also do, and maybe it might be useful. So we started the activity and we learned pretty soon that Rajesh Sundaration and team in ISC had also started a similar activity. So we joined forces and we had intensive interaction for a month and a half. And we built this agent-based simulator, uh, city simulator uh, in C++. It's uh, very efficient. And, you know, you could model 13 million people for months in a matter of few hours. This was running on a high-performance computing system. So that went on for a while. And over time, uh, you know, all of us got involved in Cero surveys. I was involved in Mumbai Cero survey. Rajesh was involved in Bangalore and uh, Karnataka Cero surveys. So we went our own ways. Daksh Mittal joined me, I think, August or September 2020. And it's an extra, extraordinary kind of, uh, well, it's just a one-man team, basically. So you could do all the coding we need to do. And between he and I, we could work out the theory that we needed. So that's how we kind of, so what I'll talk about is mostly the work that later on Daksh and I did, and then Shubhada was also part of the group. So we did that. This was, again, as I mentioned, uh, late 2020, basically. Uh, just to recap, so India has had three big waves. So on the top, you see the confirmed cases. You know, so this is for all of India, as you know, you know, these are small, small waves, and this is just a combination of that. So it's hiding many different waves happening at different times. Uh, but the big one was in 2020, around September, it peaked. And then we had a Delta wave, which actually originated somewhere in Maharashtra around January, kind of took shape. And in February 1st, when Mumbai opened up, you know, Mumbai had settled down by then and it finally decided to open up its trains. These trains in Mumbai carry about 8-9 million people daily. So that opening up and the trains opening up became a super spreader event. When you have a highly infectious variant available at that time, which is small, but you know, it gives it an opportunity to take off. And then from Mumbai, it eventually, plausibly, it went to all of India and then the uh, rest of the world. In any case, the Delta wave was enormously scary for all of India, and it happened first in Mumbai, and then after a few months, it went to the rest of India, more or less in a synchronized manner. And then things calmed down, and we saw the Omicron wave in roughly December, January this year. Okay, so what I'll do in this talk is I'll briefly review the agent-based simulator. Since all of you are more or less familiar with this, I'll keep this very short, but I'll just give you an idea of you know, how we've been thinking about this. I'll talk about some of its successes uh, for Mumbai. It's very interesting, uh, I guess, you know, in some sense, the fact that Mumbai is crowded, it has lots of people, but it's very crowded and dense, makes it an easier problem to forecast. So it's somewhat easier to kind of use these models and say meaningful things in Mumbai than it would be in other places, I would imagine. And the failure, of course, was the Delta wave. Not saying anything would also be a failure, I guess. Nobody just anticipated this. And, no epidemiologist told us to be careful about the Delta wave. How bad can it be? So in that sense, I guess everybody failed. 
so then I'll talk about the kind of work we did. The way we were working at that time was, you know, our aim was to inform policy. And this is mostly a Mumbai effort. For us, it was primarily a Mumbai model. And we were engaging with the municipal corporation from Mumbai. So we write these small reports and communicate to them as well as to general public through newspapers. So that's how we operated. So we made projections. We made some comments on second wave, potential third wave and the third wave itself. So I'll talk about that. And, you know, by the time we reached third wave or even second wave, our computer was running for the real time of one year, one and a half years. So massive computation effort. So what looked like two hours of effort when we started out was 12 hours, 14 hours of effort per simulation run you know, by the time we went to the middle 2021 there was. So computation time was a big issue and we spent a lot of time thinking about this. So we developed deeper understanding of the probabilistic structure of COVID spread and of the simulation model. And we realized that initially it's a branching process. So a person has number of children, they have number of children, etc. So initially the randomness is captured by a branching process. But as you may know, the branching process also pretty soon stabilizes in the sense it there's an intensity to each sample path, but given the intensity, it evolves deterministically. So it has exponential growth and proportions are against different types of components. It has those proportions stabilize. So that's the interesting feature of the branching process and also of the epidemic process. And thereafter, because it may have a random initial state, but it's reached a deterministic evolution given that random state. So thereafter, there's a mean field behavior takes over. And the issue is to how to exploit that to speed up the simulation model. So we'll discuss how to simulate a 13 million city, which is Mumbai, using a 1 million city simulator. And what we do is we use these shift, scale, and restart features. So I'll talk about this. All right, this is some of the work we've done over time. So you can see initially, there's a massive 19 people effort with Rajesh Sundareshan and his team in ISC, and then my colleagues and students in TIFR. Then I guess some, most of this effort is largely with uh, Daksh Mittal and also some with Shubhad Dagarwal. And my colleagues, I should mention Palad Harsha, Rampasa Sapta Rishi, and then many students who were involved early on. All right, so agent-based simulation uh, allows detailed modeling. I guess the interesting point here is that if you're aiming for a somewhat accurate model, and over time we realize that, okay, you really don't get very accurate model, there are key parameters you don't know. But nonetheless, it should be robust to changes. I think so simulation models do a good job. And the part of the reason is that, for example, for Mumbai, you see on the left, where do people stay? And then on the right, you see where do people work? So these are maps of city Mumbai. So there's a lot of transportation that happens. And a lot of people actually come from outside to Mumbai as well. So with so much of heterogeneity, and then you see on the right, more than half of Mumbai lives in slums. And slums are enormously dense. TFRs, I don't know if you can see my cursor, it's on this tip here. It's on the southernmost tip of Mumbai. And when I came to Mumbai 20 years ago, it seemed enormously crowded. But if you see this picture, it's the least crowded area of Mumbai. So that's the way things are. And slums are just kind of packed with people. So then with all of this heterogeneity, you really do need more of a simulation model rather than an aggregate model like SIR, SEIR, et cetera. So homogeneous assumption is probably not reasonable. And then, as I mentioned earlier, 8 million passenger trips on a normal working day, 90% of estimated population uses trains. So we built this simulation model, I think. So it'll be interesting to know how fast your simulation models are. But what we did do was we had some people in our team who were very well versed with how to do programming, really cutting edge. So this was C++. So we created a 13 million city and I, my guess is it was running pretty fast compared to a lot of other people who were doing simulation modeling. So in that sense, I think we had a fairly optimized code. But you have people staying in homes, going to workplaces, schools, communities. So all those details were modeled basically, how people interact. And later on, we modeled how to reduce variance in the system, reinfections when needed, vaccination schedule. We tried to follow the vaccination schedule that happened in Mumbai in a realistic manner. So all of those features could be introduced. So let me just say a few things here. So demographics, employment, geospatial data for each locality. So all of this was available to us from census data, 2011. So little inaccurate, but Mumbai population has not changed much since then. And probably, you know, composition has changed, but not very much. Um, age of household, workplace, and school size distributions. 
We did a sero survey for Mumbai, and that also gave us some more data about age distribution, particularly in slums. And you find that population in slums, as you'd expect, is younger, which kind of also explains that although they saw massive amount of infection early on, the severe health consequences were not quite as much. And then we had origin and destination matrices from earlier studies from Mumbai, and we incorporated in our model. So this is some of the data that we had. Just some details here. Uh, I'll just recap very quickly. So how does the simulation dynamics work? We initialize a synthetic city which matches the actual city. Uh, we select the city with initial infection at time zero. Time zero was chosen for us, I think, around February fifteenth or so, two thousand twenty. And the point is, if you start at that time with hundred people randomly distributed, the fatality profile that you see for a calibrated model exactly matches what we saw in in, in Mumbai in late March, early April. Before the lockdowns happened, so that was how we calibrated the model. And setting initial time was part of this calibration. So you start the city at time zero, and then you look at every susceptible person at every time period. Time period is incremented every six hours, and you see how many infectious people is that person exposed to. You compute the rate it's exposed to, then you flip a coin, and the person with some probability then becomes exposed. And then the person follows the disease progression cycle. Independently now of uh, how the disease evolves elsewhere, and then this is repeated after every time period, and that's how we get our simulation output. And the one question: as you went in time forward, you still started the simulation from March 2020, because we stopped doing that after a while. I mean, it was impossible to calibrate it that early in time. So I was to understand if you did it, and if so, how you did it. No, we did it. <laughs> I think we were getting a good match right through with some fittings that we had to do for Delta Wave. I'll talk about later. Yeah, I mean, I think in IRC they had implemented that you could store the data. What happened, say, in December two thousand twenty, and they have to just start from there. We didn't implement that, so I think this way at least we knew what we were doing. So. Because we had hard time getting information on all the interventions that were active. You know, we get some sense. So. You could match it, but then the outcomes would be different. Anyways, yeah, I just wanted to check. So good to know what you did. Thanks. Yeah, I mean there were various points at which we were projecting some things, and they were matching the observed data. For example, zero positivity, even in two thousand twenty, when it was kind of matching what tests were showing. So we thought broadly, we've got something which is in the ballpark. Okay, thanks. And then you know you've seen this. So this is a disease progression cycle. So person is exposed for some random number of days, then infections for a small time period when they're pre-symptomatic, and some are symptomatic, some are asymptomatic and recover. The symptomatic some fraction become hospitalized in an age-dependent manner. Hospitalized become critical in an age-dependent manner, and so on and so forth. So this was a disease progression matrix that was taken from Verity et al. early on. You know, they work in January, February 2020 in Wuhan. And then we did some tweaks to it. We never really had good data to kind of come up with the Indian matrix, but we did tweaks here and there to match to what we saw and to calibrate to the model that we had. This was all done somewhat early on. So probability of going to hospitalize or being critical as a function of age. So this matrix was essentially taken from Verity et al. and then modified somewhat when we got more data. Interventions, lockdown was okay. This is primarily all of this was taken from Neil Ferguson's research papers that they were implementing and tweaked to match India. So I won't go through this. I'll presume all of you are somewhat familiar with these things. I mean, how to model a lockdown, how to model case isolation, home quarantine, so on and so forth. Let me go to this part. This may be of interest to you. So some past projections for Mumbai. So this chart is interesting. Uh, It sets the stage for what I'll be discussing for a few more slides. So the red bars are the fatalities actually seen in Mumbai. So it starts from March first of 2020, and this goes on till I guess mid to late October. This is when we had published one of our earlier reports. So as I mentioned, the red bars are the, the fatalities as they were reported for Mumbai, and then you know we set our models to match this slope. So that's how our transmission rates were calibrated. And then we said that okay, some percentage of population is compliant, so 60% of population in non-slums is compliant, 40% in slums is compliant. These numbers were chosen to kind of match the fatalities that we saw around here. 
So with this, we got this match. All the other parameters were kind of just reasonably set. So, so of course, there are these gaps here, which were never quite understood why this data was reported the way it was. Some data issues with Mumbai. But with this, you could see that, you know, fatalities were coming down as the model would project. Around this point, we came up with a report where we did not anticipate this bump. We were not aware that there was a festival season going on in Mumbai. This is what's called Ganpati, where a lot of people come outside. So after a report, we saw this bump. So that was a learning for us that we need to be more aware of the world outside us, that there are all these festivals happening. But what we saw was that, you know, if you do a small fix, that you increase community interactions by so much and non-compliance by so much, you're more or less able to replicate this bump. What was nice was it kind of told us how to think about Diwali, Christmas, other holidays later on. So we kind of knew how to model them going forward. So based upon these things, we could say this was mid-October, that if you open up on November 1st, this is the green line. If you open up the trains, etc., you know, you'll see this kind of bump in fatalities and corresponding increase in hospitalization and other things. I'm just going to focus on fatalities here. And then things will calm down. If you open up on January 1st instead, you'll see this orange curve. Right? So you'll again see a small bump later because you've opened up. This would be in February, March, etc. So this was interesting. The reason we went this way was at that time, we didn't really know that the vaccines were coming and how effective they would be. So the sense was, you know, city really should think of opening up and, you know, certain health consequences, you're just shifting them a little bit in time by opening up late. So you might as well open up early. So there's a lot of suffering that's going on on the ground. At least people can get back to work and children can go back to school. So that was the way we were thinking about these scenarios. Now, this is what really happened on the right hand side. So you can see what happened was that Mumbai actually fully opened up on February 1st, as I mentioned earlier. You know, fatalities generally show up one month later for any intervention that goes on. So you can see that our January projections more or less match what actually happened in Mumbai till February 1st and even a little bit later. I mean, projections were a little lower than what actually happened, but that's also because we didn't quite understand or model the fact that as numbers come down, people's behaviors become more lax. So once you accommodate for that in a reasonable way from Google's mobility report, you can more or less match the kind of fatality that we saw till February 1st. So it seemed that, you know, our models were doing quite well, that the simulation models actually have ability to project and predict. So we were quite happy with ourselves uh, till February 1st. I personally was looking into how to model climate modeling using simulation. I thought, you know, these things are easy. In any case, so that's 2021, February 1st, and that's when the Delta wave happened. So mind you, we expected this kind of bump to happen. By February 15th, when cases started rising, we still thought that, okay, this is well be just because of opening up. But by February 20th or so, the cases suddenly began to rise so fast, we became enormously worried that something else is going on, something that we don't understand. And then we just kind of watched to see what was going on, reading up on what researchers had to say worldwide. By April or so, it kind of seemed that you can maybe there are variants or more infectious. So now this curve is a fitting exercise. This is not a projection at all. Earlier, what I showed you was we were able to project three or four months in advance and say something meaningful. And I think we could say for Mumbai, because as I mentioned earlier, Mumbai is a crowded place. So once a disease takes off, then its trajectory is somewhat easier to project. Also, one thing we did in our calibration was, you know, we had done this Cerro survey for Mumbai where we tested people in some slums and in non-slums. So that data was very useful to, for us to kind of calibrate the model correctly. Also, we said that in the slums that in transmission rate is higher and by a factor of three. And that was giving us the kind of seropositivity that we saw in slums vis-a-vis -vis non-slums. So, so with all of that, we had some kind of predictive power. Now, what you see here is what happened in Mumbai was Fatality stayed low for a very long time. And then after mid-March, there was a steep rise. Now, this was something we saw in cases earlier. So this was very interesting that, you know, how do you see things being so low and then a steep rise all of a sudden? And the way we addressed this was, because we, again, didn't really quite know how to model these things. We did a variety of scenario analysis. We said, okay, what if this was explained by opening up of the economy? So we tried different opening up scenarios. What if there was reinfections? People suddenly who were infected had become susceptible. Now, mind you, in Mumbai, our projections were that about 67% people were already infected by February 1st. 
So a lot of protection was there and, you know, we weren't hearing of that much of reinfections. So it made sense to kind of ignore reinfections, but we tried all the scenarios. And then we said, okay, what if there was a variant? So we played out with different kinds of variants, different amounts and different infectiousness. And what fitted very well was having about two to two and a half percent of infections on February 1st with a variant, which is about two to two and a half times more infectious. So with those numbers, you get a perfect match, more or less. You get a very nice match. You're able to explain this steep convexity, which otherwise was hard to explain. So this was interesting. You know, these were things which we were kind of tweeting in uh, mid to late April. And I think in some sense, it's nice that using just computational tools, we arrived at numbers which seem to have become a consensus later on, that indeed Delta variance was in the ballpark of two times more infectious. So that was interesting. I say this because, you know, on, I think, April 22nd, I tweeted that Delta variant four to five times more infectious matches our data best. And then we found that there was a bug in our code. We were not matching the chain infectiousness very well. We corrected for that, and then it came to two, two and a half times. So we were in dark and just playing with numbers. It was not like we had heard it from somewhere and we tried to replicate that number. So that was interesting. And uh, as I mentioned, the way we were kind of addressing this was we were letting the, the municipal cooperators know and after a while, you know, they only needed so much of my advice, but we were also engaging with the public through newspapers. This is just a picture to show that if we said that what explains this increase is opening up the economy, you would just get a very different slope, no matter what you tried. So you will not be able to replicate the kind of slope that we saw. So this was not scientific, but, you know, our computational models were taking enormous amount of time. We didn't really have the time to do a more systematic stochastic optimization based kind of analysis at that time. But these things you could see that, you know, it'll be difficult to explain the kind of fatalities we saw, at least by economy opening up. And similarly by reinfections, you know, if you assume that a lot of population had suddenly become susceptible on February 1st, or they were becoming susceptible over time, we tried a variety of schedules, you could not really get the kind of slope that we actually saw. Things would have to happen in a very precise manner to explain the kind of slope that we saw. And uh, that was not being explained by what we read in the newspapers, the kind of data that was coming out in research on reinfections. So, I mean, all of these seems less likely to explain what we saw. And uh, what did explain, as I mentioned, was small percentage of new variant, which was about two, two and a half times more infectious. That matched the data much, much better. This is just a curve now of how, in our model's view, seropositivity varied over time. The blue line represents in non-slums, which is less than 50% of Mumbai, and red line represents in the slums, which is more than 50%. And on July 1st, thereabouts, you see that about 17-18% of non-slums are infected, about 56% of slums are infected. This is the information we got from Cerro Survey that we did in July 15th. And thereafter, to answer uh, your point, in February 1st, thereabouts, you know, we were seeing seropositivity of the order of 67% or so. And the kind of tests which were being done here and there seem to also suggest this number. And I think around May and June, I think June or something, we were seeing seropositivity of about 80%. And tests being done at that time for the city were also coming up with these numbers. In the sense, people collected blood at different medical units and tested them for seropositivity. And the numbers people were coming were, were also close to 80%. So things were more or less matching. So we went ahead uh, you know, with that, but we were clear at this time that you know, one can't use this model to make projections anymore. There's a lot that we don't know. So what we did for potential third wave, and this is now I think June, July, was that we said that we don't have a scenario to project. What we'll do instead is we'll do an extensive kind of a scenario analysis, which guides policy. So we study peak fatalities under varying scenarios of reinfections, variants, and the vaccine effectiveness. We thought peak deaths are a good measure of healthcare facilities needed. So, I mean, in some sense, the point also is for policymakers to show everything on a single slide, so information in a concise manner, so it makes it easier for them to see the big picture and make the right kind of decisions. And then we made some assumptions about, okay, we don't know when the new variant will initiate or reinfections will happen, so some kind of worst case analysis. So as per our model on June 1st, around 20% of population is susceptible. Now, this is June 1st, 2021. And 10% of all the population has been vaccinated. So this was the kind of picture we presented. So you can see that, you know, this was peak fatalities, 2020 June, about 105, 100, between 105 and 110 people 
that was the reported number. Actual fatalities may have well have been much more. And then in May 2021, it was about 90. This is in the Delta wave, which for Mumbai, by the way, was not as bad as it was for the rest of India. And the reason was that you know Mumbai had a high seropositivity going into the Delta wave. So as I mentioned, about 65 to 70 percent. So things were somewhat much worse, I guess, for the rest of the country, where there was more susceptible population as a percentage. And then we looked at, okay, what if vaccine effectiveness is low and the coverage is extensive or the coverage is also poor? If reinfection is 0% or 5% or 10%, if there's a new strain that shows up, which is even more infectious than Delta strain, if it's more virulent. So these are the different scenarios that we played out. And the big picture was that in a reasonably kind of worst case scenario that you construct, where suddenly 10% of the population becomes amenable to reinfection, you have a more virulent strain, more infectious strain, uh, and the vaccines are not as effective. You see peaks which are not too far from what we saw in second wave. See, at this time, the whole city, the whole country was terrified. You know, they wanted to be prepared with oxygen because we saw what happened during the Delta wave where, you know, everywhere you had people struggling for oxygen. So the mandate was that let's create as much oxygen facilities as we can. So this was somewhat reassuring that at least in somewhat a pessimistic scenario, if you're prepared at the level that you needed to be for a Delta wave, you should be okay, at least for Mumbai. I mean, it's not like you need two or three times more level of oxygen that, that you needed at that time. I mean, that's the kind of advice people needed, I guess. This was, I guess, as I mentioned, a report in June. Then we had said that, okay, if nothing bad happens, if no new variant shows up, and vaccination strategies are effective, then you see these lower curves that I show you, this purple and red uh, and green curves. And this is kind of what really we, we saw in the coming months until the Omicron wave happened. So to that extent, you know, our models were ballpark telling what things to expect. I should mention something which is interesting in all of this. If you see these old pictures, these are scenarios where we are saying, okay, reinfections happen. This was, I guess, the economy opening up and this is where reinfections are happening. What's interesting is that the peaks, even in these scenarios, the peaks and troughs are more or less at the same time. So that was interesting that we tried all kinds of different scenarios uh, with variations, but you know it was robust to the timings of peaks and troughs. Now, you guys may already know this fact, but this was still reassuring that some things can be said through the modeling effort. So we actually made these kind of projections, I guess, end of April, uh, maybe mid-March, I think about when to expect the peak to happen and when to expect things to calm down. And those by and large kind of held for Mumbai. So that, uh, that's interesting. And this is what we did for third wave. For third wave, we kind of had to go with the data that was coming from South Africa. So we said, okay, suddenly people who've been infected, 35% of them are now amenable to reinfection. Something suggested from South, South African data. And then we said the new variant is again further two, two and a half times. Well, I forget the number, but around uh, two times more infectious. Yeah, I think two times Delta. That's what we have here. With those numbers, you know, we saw this massive peak around early January that came down very quickly. So again, we didn't want to project case numbers at all, but we could say when the peak will happen and when things will calm down. So this is a quote that we had, which was reported widely that the peak cases will happen between January 6th and January 13th. This was actually said by us, we did this modeling very late on January 4th, but uh, it was interesting because general thinking at that time, and a lot of people were reporting that in the newspaper that they expected peak to be in the third week of January, but it actually happened on January 8th. So again, showing that, you know, some things are easier to project with a good simulation model, with a reasonably good simulation model. I wonder if one could have drawn these kind of conclusions with a SIR kind of aggregate model. These are, I mean, this is something which requires more research, I think, with our simulation models better, at least in this sense. Okay, so key drawback in our simulation was the computer taken to run the city. The question was, can a smaller city with same home school workplace structure give us the correct answers? So that's the technical question. So in some sense, after a while, you know, I come from a more applied probability background. So we were more obsessed with this question than with what was going on in the world at large and getting our modeling right. So this was absorbing more of our time. So let me just give a picture of what was going on there. So this is now our model being run under no intervention scenario. And uh, the blue line is this 12.8 million city that was Mumbai. And the orange line is 1 million city, a replica of Mumbai, but smaller in size. 
but how structure, work structure, all of that is identical more or less. And then you scale up the output from this 1 million model by a factor of 13. So what's interesting is that initially they do match, but then you can actually show mathematically that the smaller model will underestimate the peak will be lower. And that's because of convexity that comes up. There's noisiness if you start with fewer people. So let me just clarify a little bit more. We are starting this simulation with uh, 10 people in 1 million city and 128 people in 12.8 million city. And we're just simply scaling the output by a factor of 12.8. So when you have 10 people in 1 million city, it's a very noisy situation. So sometimes you see lots of infections, sometimes it just dies down. And there's a connection that comes up that, you know, lots of people getting infected, that has a bigger effect. There's no linearity, so it doesn't get canceled by fewer infections. And that's showing up here. So that's why you get a lower peak here. So that can be shown. On the other hand, if you had started both the simulation models with large number of people infected, so 100 people infected in 1 million city and 1,280 people infected in a bigger city, then you get more or less identical profile of infected people under no intervention scenarios. And this is indicative. You see the same numbers for hospitalization, same numbers for fatalities, etc. And this matching strengthens if you start with even more people. So 1,000 people, so the right-hand side picture is, I'm starting a city with 1,000 people infected in 1 million city and 12,800 people infected in a larger city. And then you get a perfect match more or less. So that's telling you that once there's enough infection in the city, then scaling does work. Now, this probably is, I guess, may, may be obvious to your group, but for us, we were learning our way through that this is what happens when you have enough infections, but when you don't have enough infection, then you see a mismatch in the numbers. So that got us wondering, okay, how to make things work out. And what you also see is that if I run both the larger city as well as the smaller city with same number of infections early on, 100 infections, then you see both the models exactly match in terms of other infections growing up till day about 35. So both big city and small city are going proceeding exactly if I give them same number of infections. And what's going on is that there's a branching process. You know, 100 people, whether it's in the small city or in the big city, they're seeing the same population around them. So they're infecting same number of people. And that goes on for about 35 days. By that time, infections become enough so now, okay, the smaller city will behave differently from a larger city. That's an issue to keep in mind going forward. And this 35 day is actually also very interesting. You know, if you see the it's log of N, N is the city side divided by log of row. That comes out to be about 37 days. So we developed theory which supports this time. But in terms of pictorially, you know, what we come up with after seeing all of this, how to get the smaller model to exactly match the larger model, we do what's called shifting and scaling the smaller model. So it's as follows. So let's look at this path on the left-hand side. So we generate the smaller model for 35 days. It's more or less an exact match with a bigger model. On 35th day, we find out the number of infections in the system. And then we ask ourselves, when do we see that many infections divided by 12.8? And that turns out to be, let's say, on the 20th day in this case. So on the 20th day, the smaller model has 12.8 times less infection than the larger model. But by 20th day, if you look at the branching process theory, things have already stabilized. In particular, proportions of different types of infection that you have, they've stabilized. So that proportion is not changing with time anymore. So I'll talk about that in a moment. But really, in a multi-type branching process, what happens very quickly is that the proportion of different types of people that you have by multi-type branching process, I just mean, okay, now you have a parent giving children, but different types of children, and each type of children, again, has different types of children, so on and so forth. So proportions across different types stabilizes. So that means even if I shift from day 20 to day 35, my proportions have not changed. My distribution of starting time has not changed. So that's very important. So that allows me to shift here. So I can take this smaller path from day 20, scale it, and now since I have enough infections, the scale version actually represents a larger model. And the path I get from day 20 onwards, I just patch it on, concatenate it to the path I had to day 35, and I get a more or less perfect match to the larger simulation. So that's the idea that, you know, this is how you can exactly replicate the larger model with the smaller model. And then you note that, okay, there were some interventions that happened that also needed to be captured. So for example, suppose the intervention happened on day 45. 
by day 35 or so there about the government realizes that something serious is going on and they start planning and by day 45 there's a lockdown of sorts so it happens 10 days after day 35 so you know to get that right in your simulation you restart your simulation and then you know your day 20 is going to correspond to day 35 and then you do an intervention on day 30 which will cost to the day 45 now and now you take this path from day 20 onwards and patch it with the path that you have till day 35 and now this restarted shifted scale model exactly matches your simulation output and this is uh, true in great generality so let me just show you here so this is a realistic model that we had for mumbai so the blue line is the actual 12.8 million model with all the interventions that we have and the interventions are there's a lockdown there's opening up we have this google mobility data we have this government circulars etc with all of that we got an idea of how the city was behaving and the smaller model exactly matches the larger model i think it's very interesting to see how a scaled down model can replicate i think some of the details of how the scaling down is done mm -hmm. and what it means to scale down interventions as well and then when you scale up so in some ways it appears that at least on the plots and it's quite interesting that the aggregate statistics might come out reasonably good. Where does the model start diverging in terms of heterogeneity? I mean, the whole reason for the agent-based model was to have the heterogeneous aspect, right? So maybe the slum part might not match up, right? Maybe, you know, Tane might not match up, right? I don't know. I'm just making that. The, I'm just trying to understand how the smaller model was made effectively and then pulled back. We can tell you more later on what we did as well, but this is quite interesting. So if you could just give us a sense. The home structure is the same in the smaller model and the larger model. The school structure is the same. In communities, okay, you say that in a larger model, that each person is seeing a much bigger number of people in the community. They're seeing a lesser number of people in the smaller model, but the rate is that much higher in the smaller model. So if you were to look at Poisson approximation, that's working equally well for both the models. And that works out till about, like I said, about 35 days. And by that time you have enough infections in any case, so you can do scaling and that works very well. So for city level, I think this kind of approximation should work quite well. I mean, certainly it worked well for Mumbai because Mumbai is again, very crowded. It's hard for me to say, actually, we haven't played around enough to say that where things break down, but that's a great question. We just. We're too busy just getting the math of this right. Right. But, it's interesting, actually, that you can yeah. you can prove this a little bit, at least. So, yeah. nice. so these things are good proof. Yeah, sure. There's a question there. Uh, Anil, go ahead. Thanks. Really fascinating. So I have a couple of quick questions, and then we can go on later. So one is intuitively in the regular branching process. Basically, what you're working with is it's a tree in the initial part. So this 35 days... That's like a, some threshold for which it continues to be a tree. Is that what? Well, that's when the number of people who are infected become of the same order as the number of people who are susceptible. So the branching process assumption breaks down. Okay. Uh -huh. So that's because population is increasing as yeah. root bar time t. And when root bar time t becomes of the same order as the overall population, that's nice. when things break down. But the network is quite heterogeneous, right? It's not like a clique or anything. So... I have to be interested in seeing the math later to understand. Because we've taken a 1 million city, we're not doing it with 100,000 city. Okay. So I yeah. think there's still some homogeneity that helps us. I see. The math needs to be defined to say that, okay, too small a city will also not work. So 1 yes. million works, half a million gives you somewhat accurate, but below that, it, things won't work out. When you do the scalings, you're taking uh, like the number of cases you have in 35 days, let's say, and, and in the bigger city, you're going back in time and taking that as a seeding, right? So let's say there are going to be 10,000 cases. How do you spread them out? Is it going to be random or is it something else? Since the seeding seems to matter a lot from what we understand. Yeah. No, you just take the data in the smaller model on the day 21st when the infections <laughs> are the same. So you don't, there's no need to spread out anymore. Whatever was there is what you carry on from. In that sense, yeah, that's right. So... So you let the model tell you what the distribution is. I okay. think that's important. Yeah. Nice. Because by that time, mm -hmm. things are no longer random. You may start it off with randomness on day zero, but by day 35, things have changed. But yeah. proportions have been similar from day 20 to day 35. So you could use day 20 from the simulation model. Thanks. Very nice. So you effectively saved 
the first 20 days of big simulation? Because we know that first 20 days, big simulation, small simulation are identical. Right. So we saved the time running the big simulation for the first 20 days. Well, throughout, right? It's we're only running a small simulation model. But throughout. what happens after? So I didn't understand what happens after 20. You go to the mean field model at that point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We okay. just start scaling things. Okay. So let me actually say it here. So first 35 days, we use a smaller model. It's same as a larger model. So we take the output from the smaller model. Thereafter, we take the smaller model from 20 days onwards, but scale it by a factor of 12.8. And we call the day 20 as day 35. Okay. So you never run the larger model. You just, first time you shift and you scale, basically. That's why you call it the shift and scale. That's right. Yeah. And okay. thereafter, we do restart because we do the intervention at the right time on the smaller model, which we're also true for the larger model. And then we paste it together. So the interventions don't have to change or do they have to be scaled down? As no, well? no, 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 they don't to, no, they don't have to change. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, okay. You have to kind of think through everything. So what I've not discussed here is that we had these small networks, neighborhood networks and random city networks where we kind of had a geographical area, which was, we said, okay, person has more interaction in that community than the broader community. So then one has to kind of ask oneself, how do we adjust for that in the right manner? So that's a structural issue. It's not about interventions, but certain kind of structures, if you're doing some funky things, you have to be careful how small translates to big. But in our experience, one could come up with the right mapping. So I've not shown that here, but interventions, we no, I don't, I don't think interventions we ever had to change. All the interventions went right through. Right. And you could intuitively see why they were. Why right. They were. So I'll tell you why I asked this question. You know, interventions that just say, which is saying on day 50, I vaccinate 20%. That seems to be okay. You can scale 20% is scaled value, right? But interventions that are absolute, we can also potentially scale, but interventions that are adaptive in some form, right? If certain events happen, then you do certain things. I do not know exactly how the interpretation of that if then else would be, because the if part might be holding in one model, but might not hold in the other model. And I don't have the best example, but I'm just thinking aloud here, uh, but we can discuss that later on. Yeah, thanks. Well, you know, we are working in a mean field framework at that time. So you have to ask yourself, in the mean field setting, will anything change by this uh, adaptive manner? Or right. will they have? Yeah. So theoretical support in asymptotic regime. So what we do is we consider a sequence of systems indexed by N, the number of people, and let we let N go to infinity. Home, school, and workplace structure is independent of N. So their numbers are going to increase linearly with N. Communities are going to remain the same. So their population is going to increase with N. But population is increasing with N, but each person's chance of hitting another person is decreasing with N. So overall, the number of people a person is infecting is still the same early on. So there are finite M particle types. So this is just a recap. If MIJ denotes the expected number of type J offspring of a single type I particle in one generation, so if M is that matrix, then, you know, we have this peron frobenius theory, which tells us that M to the power N, if you just raise the matrix to power N, that's just going to grow exponentially as per the peron frobenius eigenvalue. We don't need to worry about these eigenvectors here. This is important. So let vector Zn denote the number of particles of each type at time N. So here in our analysis, because analysis becomes quite messy and difficult soon. So we're just going to assume that there are finitely many types of people, you know, depending on their age, depending on the disease state, maybe their community type, uh, we can classify people differently in finitely many ways. And that gives you a feel for what's going on. So Zn is you know, the number of particles of each type at time n. Then key result is that for a non-negative random variable, and this is from, again, for branching process theory, w, Zn, this vector of different type of infected people is going to grow exponentially at rate rho. And then there's this random variable w, which is essentially telling you the intensity of the sample path. Where W is large, you have a lot more people getting infected. Where W is small, you have less people getting infected. But whichever way, whichever be the value of W, the proportion of Zs are going to stabilize very soon. That's what you get from this picture here. You know, because each one of the proportion types is growing as a linear function of W. When we normalize, the proportions are independent of, of W. So they will stabilize and that allows us to shift across time when we're in the branching process phase. So that's very useful to us. 
And W is going to capture the same path dependent intensity. So that's why, you know, different paths are different. So all the future mean field analysis, how things evolve is a function of this W. That's sample path dependent. And we use simulation to tell us what the W is. We don't estimate the W per se. It's just that the smaller model is also seeing the same W basically. So we use the smaller model to give us a realization of this W, the intensity. And rho also is, is implicitly there. Rho is the growth rate, exponential growth rate. All right. So till time one minus epsilon log n by log rho. So basically what I'm saying is till time log n by log rho. This is the time where the number of people infected or affected is a negligible proportion of the overall population. Overall population is still susceptible. Till this time, epidemic process grows like the branching process. And this comes out to be about 37 days, 35, 37 days. So the proportion of susceptible is nearly one. Exponential in infection growth rate that quickly becomes deterministic condition on the path dependent intensity. So it just depends upon W basically. But given W, you know, the growth is exponential. And proportions stabilize quickly, and this allows us to shift and scale, as I mentioned earlier. Now, mean field phase. So as such, even in the branching process, very soon the proportions have stabilized. You know what the W is, the intensity is, and thereafter the process is growing in a deterministic manner, even early on, even from day 20 onwards, for example, uh, before that. But you know, once you have the number of affected people, same order as susceptible, Thereafter, you can do mean field analysis to see how you know, the population is going to vary. So this is what is mentioned here that let's take n to be log epsilon n upon log rho time in our simulation and assume that the empirical distribution across types is converging to a W dependent limit, right? So at this time, things have stabilized and thereafter you can show that essentially the population infection is going to evolve deterministically satisfying these mean field equations. So this is just, you know, how the expected value of different proportions is going to evolve over time. This is a transition matrix here. So, so if I find somewhat rather surprising in this result, and clearly I don't understand it, that's why, mm -hmm. is no dependence of the result on the density of this network. Because, you know, at least intuitively to me, this mm -hmm. result Somewhere the edge. No, the row captures the network structure, right? Rho is the transmission probability, no? No, no. It's the eigenvalue, right? Spectral radius, no? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, rho is the rho is the, the eigenvalue. Okay. But otherwise, these transition matrices, how you go from one time period to another time period, uh, they capture the more detailed heterogeneity in the network. But uh, the way we are thinking about the network is okay, it's like one million population separated in 24 wards. So each ward still has enough population. So mean field is, you know, taking place at that level as well. So yeah, we can afford to assume away heterogeneity in that sense. Things have stabilized, so they're moving deterministically. So they're deterministically different wards, different populations are interacting with each other as they evolve. Okay, thanks. So right now our aim is very specific. We just want to replicate the 13 million model which we have for the city with a smaller model. So it's a simple mathematical problem and that we are able to do. Whether the 13 million model itself was a realistic model, that's another question, but you know, that's the model people have been using. So infection process has order N infections and in combination with settled population evolves very close to its mean field limit. Empirical distribution for each time T converges to a limiting process. So the empirical distribution converges to limiting process. So at every time T, you know, the proportions basically have stabilized population size, how many people are infected has stabilized. Number of infected at time T in system of size N is approximately given by N times some function of this empirical distribution, mu of T, the mean field of the empirical distribution. So to get the largest system of size N2, we can use approximation of this empirical distribution at N1. Because 1 million is also large enough. So that also gives us a pretty good idea of what these empirical distributions are. So function of that tells you how many people are hospitalized, how many are infectious, so on and so forth. You scale it by N2, you get your result. I'm just kind of saying the same thing I've said before, that scaling works. Because both 1 million model and 12.8 million model are close to their mean field limit. So one can simply scale one to get to the other. 
So just to summarize, you know, I described the TFR ISC simulation model, and we discussed some past projection that we were able to make. And we dug into the probabilistic structure of the agent-based simulation models in an asymptotic regime. And we introduced shift scale and restart approach to use smaller models to estimate larger ones. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Indeep. One quick question I had in terms of this scaling effort is, is it possible to assess what kind of interventions still hold? For instance, I think Madhav had a similar question. I think vaccinations, anything that can be scaled down works, but like if there are network-based interventions or contact tracing, for example, is a something or like even commuting flows between say neighborhoods, since you said something about the structure needs to be preserved, like if you, if someone says, can we control the flow between the northern part and southern part, how do you approach such mapping, such interventions? Yeah, yeah. So we've not really played around with these things. You know, if the movement from northern part to southern part could be seen in the mean field sense, you know, this fraction of people are moving from one place to the other, then I think that yeah, this approximation will work out. If it's happening on a smaller scale, very small amount of population, maybe there's some super spreaders there and there. We'll have to see about that. That could potentially cause problems. Okay. What we did was, you know, we did implement realistic intervention that happened in Mumbai for the first one year, for the first 250 days, I guess. So there were lockdowns, there were opening ups, there were these festivals that came up. But these were all at the aggregate level. You know, when we said that there's a festival in Mumbai, we made all of Mumbai become less compliant for a little while. So those things worked out perfectly well. Now, my guess is if we had said, okay, some fraction of Mumbai had become less compliant, that would have also worked fine. I mean, just as a follow-up, then the question of if these are relative rates that are being scaled and also maybe with some spatial fidelity, what is stopping from using OD limit or even network OD limit? Why do you choose like a 1 million agent? True, true. So, I mean, I can easily imagine kind of using the 1 million model early on when randomness plays a role, right? The intensity is sample part dependent, whether it dies off, how long does it take to finally take off? In which, you know, some local effects where randomness is important early on. There one would use a simulation model. Potentially thereafter, one could use some kind of ODE. But, you know, in some sense, right now, this simulation is solving an ODE for us, right? The mm -hmm. ODE is in such a large dimensional space that to solve the ODE, write the ODE would be a problem. So mm -hmm. by doing the simulation, we're actually solving a deterministic problem. So that's interesting. So in fact, like you're, once you're past the stochastic extinction phase and you know aggregate properties of the dynamics, you're kind of switching to this yep. equivalent of an ODE representation. But you could say that maybe, you know, rather than solving this complicated ODE that the simulation model is solving, there's a simpler approximation which does quite well, a simpler ODE, so to speak. I think that's well, well worth future research. Right now, what's nice is that we can accommodate very easily interventions of various sorts. You know, it makes sense. Okay, there's a holiday here. People are mixing more on Saturdays, Sundays, or what's happened, trains have opened up. Now, what does that translate to a simpler ODE in terms of how mobility is changing? I think one needs to figure it out. It's probably not very difficult to do, but that needs to be done. And then you have to see how well it works and maybe there are surprising issues. Okay, yeah, thank you. When you do an intervention, row changes, right? So are you adaptively? So basically at that point, it's a different matrix. Yeah, I mean, row is an output from the simulation model, right? Simulation model doesn't really need the row per se. So when we do intervention, we're just locally changing the mobility of everybody. Right? Yeah, so but that will change the eigenvalues, right? So if you look at the network induced from that. By the time interventions start happening, uh, we are already in the mean field phase. Okay. So scaling mm -hmm. works. Yeah. Scaling mm -hmm. works already in that case. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is this work on your web page or, or maybe you can send a mail out? Is right now you'll see a three page extended abstract preparing a somewhat mm -hmm. broader version that should be out soon. Thanks. Are really interesting. Yeah. But there are mathematical problems that need to be kind of understood further. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know if we can ask one other minor thing. So we had difficulty dealing with the eigenvalue characterizations for more complicated models. So here you have not just the transmission, but recovery and waning and all of that, right? So are you taking those in or it's a simple 
independent cascades type of model or no no, no the model is very detailed uh, no like so, in this uh, analysis of the first striking anomaly kind of analysis right, right well i mean if you were to simply assume that everything is finite population can be a finite type then everything goes through now mm-hmm. finite type and having billions of types <laughs> okay theory still works as n goes to infinity but so theory still goes but you worry about the fact that actual types are many so the analysis we assume finite and that's enough for us because we're just doing everything asymptotically simulations are for a very realistic model where the mm-hmm. types are actually not finite and there also we observe that things are working well if there are gaps in theory i think it's more a issue of just getting the math right it's Okay. Empirically, everything is working out. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much again, Sandeep, for speaking with us today. Thank you, Shubhi. Great talk. Thanks.